I always feel about this time of semester like the reality is is that we're all a little bit tired, but we're doing our best because we have to. You do what you got to do when you got to do it. Uh, some of you, uh, particularly students, at some point in your life may end up working for Jessup as a student worker, uh, or you may end up someday having full-time employment at Jessup. If you have full-time employment at Jessup, one of the things that will happen is they'll say, now you gotta meet with the president. And you usually feel like, ah, what did I do? And the issue is you didn't do anything yet. All that interview with the president is, is really about a 30 minute segment and it has two parts. Number one, I ask you to tell your story. And what I usually try to do with people is say, tell me a little bit about where you were born. Tell me a little bit about your family, brothers, sisters, et cetera. Tell me a little bit about schooling. Tell me about spiritual life and, and work experience. And then why work at Jessup? What I'm really trying to do is grab hold of the story arc of your life. The second part of that interview, by the way, is I tell you some things about the story of Jessup that are important for me. I want you to be able to hear these. I want you to understand some of the values. Stories reveal character. Stories reveal heartbeat. If I could be a little uh, fly on the wall or mouse in the corner when you're hanging out with your buds or when you're hanging out with your family or friends, probably what happens some portion of the time you're together is you tell stories. Is anybody in this room a good storyteller? Like, are you a good storyteller? Okay, when I got married, my father-in-law was an amazing storyteller. The only problem with my father-in-law is I never knew if he was telling the truth. So it took me like a year or so, but eventually I figured out he had a tell. I don't know if you do any gambling. I don't. But if you do any gambling, there's a tell when people sort of, you know what cards they have because they say it a certain way. My father-in-law would tell stories, and then I would notice his left hand, which had been injured in a serious accident, his left hand would start to move like this. Whenever my father-in-law's hand started to move like this in the middle of a story, I knew he was telling me an amazing story, but it wasn't true. So that was the tell. That was the, the tell. I knew his story that he was telling me was awesome, but it wasn't true. Well, I want you to know this about the stories in the Bible. The stories that are in the Bible are told with a purpose. And the stories in the Bible are true. And the stories in the Bible are particularly true when Jesus is telling them. So for the last year or so, I've been carrying this burden to share some things about the nature and character of God. And I think the nature and character of God are revealed to the stories that Jesus told. We don't have time today to unpack it all, but in Luke chapter 15, there's a number of stories. They have to do with the lost coin. They have to do with the lost sheep. And then they ultimately have to do with the prodigal son. Has anybody ever heard the story of the prodigal son? All right, so if a lot of you are familiar with that, we're going to base a lot of what we're sharing here today on that story. But before I get into the story, let me say this to you. God is good. Oh, so lame. It must be middle of semester and you're tired. God is good? And all the time? That's right. God is good. No, it's going to keep going. I know. They call it an infinite process. But anyway, so God is good. The second thing is, is that God is a redeemer. It is the heart of God to redeem. And the third thing is, is that God is a healer. So if you're familiar with the story of the Good Samaritan, or, uh, sorry, the prodigal son, as you're familiar with that story, you probably know a lot of the details. But what you may not know is how that story started. So what I want to do is take you back to Luke chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, and I'll tell you about how that story started. Luke 15, 1 and 2, it says this. Now the tax collectors and, quote, sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So I want to just uh, say a couple things to you out of this passage. Verse 1 and 2, it's at the early part of the chapter where we see the story of the prodigal son. The first thing I want to tell you is that when Jesus gathered, he gathered a crowd of sinners. Wherever Jesus was, a bunch of bad people showed up. A bunch of messed up, sideways, confused, distorted, and deceived people were. Where Jesus was, sinners were. Jesus gathered a crowd of sinners. Now, quite frankly, we try to do that every single time we have chapel. So turn to the person next to you and say, you're a sinner. And say to the person next to you, right back to them, well, so are you. You're a sinner too. We have a room full of sinners here. A room full of imperfect, flawed, and failing people. The reality is, is that we're being like Jesus when we gather together with people who are imperfect, flawed, and failing. Jesus gathered a crowd of sinners. Here's the second thing I want you to notice, is that when Jesus gathered that crowd of sinners, religious people mutter. It is not uncommon when God shows up for religious people to be confused. Now, that might be confusing to you. Here we are in a Christian college. Here I am, the president of a Christian college, a life spent as a pastor and spiritual leader. And I'm telling you, when religious people are around Jesus, they often mutter. 
you know that I've fallen in love with the Chosen series. There are many parts of the Chosen series that I like, but I've shared with you before, kind of the theme for this year came out of the Chosen series. I think it's episode four, when Jesus picks Matthew, the despised tax collector, who's a Jewish man working for the Roman conquering government, and Jesus picks Matthew to follow him as his disciple. Well, when Jesus does that, Peter, who's a very religious person at this point in time, very sold out to Jesus, is very frustrated. And he says, how can you pick this guy? He's despised, he's hated, he betrayed us. He's going against his own people to work for the conquering Roman government. And Jesus says some variation of this, Peter, get used to different. Our theme for this year in chapel is different. When Jesus shows up, a crowd of sinners gather, and second of all, religious people mutter. Now, some of you know the story of the prodigal, but for those who don't, let me just quickly tell it. There's a guy, he's kind of wealthy. He's got a lot of money. And he's got two kids. He's got an older kid and he's got a younger kid. They're both boys. The older son is the firstborn, and in Jewish law at that time, the older son would be due for the majority of the inheritance. Let's say for sake of argument, about 60% of the inheritance. So a dad, he's got two sons. Dad's kind of wealthy. The oldest son knows that when dad finally does die and go to his heavenly reward, that the oldest son's going to get 60%. The younger son knows that no matter what his skills, talents, gifts, and abilities are, that the older son is going to get 60% and he's going to get 40%. And the younger son gets totally impatient. And it's hard to believe, but this is what he does. He goes to dad and said, hey, pops, to be honest, um, I I don't know if I can wait till you actually cross over. So here's the deal. Is there any way that I could get my 40% in advance? Now, I don't know how your dads are, but let me just tell you how I'd react to that if one of my kids came to me and said that. No bueno. It would not be good, okay, folks? But the weird thing about this particular story Jesus tells is that the father says, okay, son, and he goes out and he takes a line of credit or he cashes in a bunch of his assets or does whatever, and he gives the youngest son the 40%. The younger son takes that money, says sayonara to everybody at his home. He goes into uh, San Francisco or Vegas or one of those places. And he's got a ton of money. He's got wads of cash with him. And while he's there and while he has a lot of money, he has a lot of friends. The Bible tells us that he spends all that money on the modern equivalent of wine, women, and song. And while he's got money, he's got friends. But there's a moment in time where he runs out of cash. And he runs out of cash, he runs out of cachet. And when he runs out of cachet, all his friends who were there when the money was there, they're gone. So now what does this young brat kid do? He says, man, I can't go home. My dad will be embarrassed of me. My brother will be distant on me. And so the reality is, i got to figure out something. So what he does in the story is this very Jewish young man who's just blown 40% of his family's wealth and just messed up his whole life, he takes his life and he goes to a very unkosher pig farm. Now, if you're Jewish, by the way, you got to avoid pigs. Pigs are, are bad. But he goes to this very unkosher pig farm and says, hey, could I... Uh, work in your pig farm. I'll feed the pigs, and could you feed and clothe me and and shelter me because of feeding the pigs? And that's exactly what happens. Well, that's what goes on in the story until verse 17. Luke 15, verse 17. We'll just read a few verses. When he came to his senses, he said, wait a minute. That's not in there, but that's wait a minute. How many of my father's hired servants uh, have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I'll set out and go back to my father. I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Now, real quick, maybe it's been years ago. Did anybody remember memorizing a a, a story you were going to tell your parents? Like some way to explain what you just did, some way to explain just where you just went, some way to explain how the vase got broken, somehow to explain how your youngest brother or sister you're supposed to be watching got in trouble. If you've ever stole, told a story to your parents and you rehearse that story, this is exactly what this kid is doing. He's rehearsing the story he's going to tell Pops, so at least maybe Pops will accept him back so that he can be one of the hired hands and at least have a roof over his head and enough food to eat, okay? So I don't know what you can imagine for your life, But if you've ever rehearsed a story, or maybe some of you, this is an easier one, some of you rehearse stories like at midterms, and you rehearse stories at finals. There's a story you tell your profs, and you basically say, look, this happened, and this happened, and this happened. It's the only reason I didn't turn my paper in on time. The only reason I wasn't quite able to complete the assignment is because of, and you you got a story that you rehearse. I don't know that's ever gone with you, but a lot of times when I rehearse stories, it didn't go well. Well, in this story, verse 20 He says, he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. So I got to tell you this, he was looking for him. 
He was looking for him. While he was a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Starting to do his story. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. This son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. I believe that when Jesus tells stories, he tells stories with a purpose. And there's a variety of things I want you to hear, and I'm going to go through them very rapidly, but I hope and pray that somehow, some way, the Spirit of God takes this story and lands it in your heart in a fresh way today. I've been carrying this for a long time because I think our world, and sometimes the Christian world, does not believe that God is good. I think sometimes our world does not understand and believe, and sometimes the Christian world doesn't believe that God's a redeemer. And sometimes our world and the Christian world doesn't believe that God's a healer. God is good, he's a redeemer, and he's a healer. And the stories Jesus tells, he tells with a purpose to teach about the nature and character of God. So just quickly, we're gonna go through several things. Number one, the son came to his senses. While this young kid was in a pig pen, a very unkosher place, while his life was messed up and distorted and deceived, and while he was confused and broken and battered, there was a moment where he came to his senses. I don't know anything about your story. I don't know anything about your context. And maybe the people in your row don't know anything about you except for your smile and your fist bump and other stuff. But the truth is, somebody in this room is feeling broken and battered and bruised and deceived and distorted. And I'm telling you, there's a moment when you come to your senses. The son came to his senses. He had a moment of revelation, a moment of clarity, a moment of understanding. This is the reality of my circumstance. And the scripture says that when he came to his senses, he began to think more clearly and he began to say, I know what is right. I know I need to repair these things. And so the second thing is, he recognized the reality of his circumstances and he determined to move from being a slave to being a son. See, while he was in that pig pen, he was basically trapped by his circumstances. And when you're trapped by your circumstance, it feels like a prison, even if it's a prison of your own making. Some of you are in a prison of circumstances that uh, it's not all your fault. Other people put that on you, but you're in a prison nonetheless, and you feel like a slave. You feel like a prisoner. But when that son came to his senses, he de made a determination. It was a moment of clarity, a moment of revelation. I'm going to move from being a slave to being a son. Third thing is, many of us, while never imagining ourselves to be slaves or orphans, behave and believe that way. Again, I don't know anything about your circumstances, but this is what I do know. Shame and confusion is all over our world. Shame and confusion has often trapped many of us. And sadly, shame and confusion has often trapped many of us while in the church. You're sitting at a Christian college, you're in a Christian chapel, you got some preacher guy talking for at least a few more minutes, and while he's doing all that, you're going, nobody around me knows, but I am trapped by shame. I'm trapped by deception. I'm not in a physical pig pen. I'm not slopping the hogs in reality. But the truth is, I got all kinds of hogs and pigs in my life, and I'm feeding them all the time. And I'm trapped in my shame. One of the most beautiful parts of the story to me is when he comes to his senses, he figures out his story, he rehearses the lines, and he gets ready to come see the Father. Now, I can't prove what I'm about ready to say to you biblically. But I've always envisioned this, that the pig pen was on the outskirts of town because good Jewish community would not have a pig farm inside the town. So the pig pen's on the outskirts of town, and I've always imagined, can't prove this biblically, that the wealthy father's house was over here on a hill. And I can't prove exactly how it happened, but I'm thinking that the wealthy father, the father who's had this youngest son rip his heart out, has spent days and days and days, if not weeks, sitting on the front porch, sitting in the lawn, just wondering what he did wrong, how is this going to happen, and looking out to where he knows his son is gone, because all the bad stuff in this community doesn't happen in the community, it happens on the outskirts. And I've imagined this son coming to his senses, and I've imagined as this son came to his senses and rehearsed his story, I imagine him beginning the long walk from the pig pen and the pig farm. Have you ever been around pigs, by the way? 
It is not uh, one of those odors they sell in Paris on the runway, okay? It's a bad stink. So he's been with a pig, so he's been in the pig farm, and I imagine him starting to walk this way and coming into the very outskirts of town. And what I've always imagined, but I can't prove, is that the wealthy, wealthy father who's given up 40% of his net worth to his youngest son to go out and ruin that stuff and all his destructive living, he's looking and he sees his son coming into the edge of town. Can't prove this, but this is what I've always imagined. And what I've imagined is the father running to the son. The the biblical text says that. He runs to his son. And one of the reasons why I think the father ran to the son is because he didn't want that son to walk that walk of shame through that town on his own. I've always imagined that the father went to embrace the son to demonstrate to the whole town My son is not the pig pen son. My son is not the pig pen servant or slave. My son is my son. And I love him and I embrace him. So look at this. This is the fourth thing. The father ran to him, and I want you to hear this, that fathers run, do not run to slaves, they run to sons. The reason the father ran to the son is because it was his son. And I want you to hear this. If you're trapped in shame, If you're trapped in deception and destruction, there is someone who loves you so completely, so perfectly, so fully, who delights in every aspect of your being. You go like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You have no idea what stuff I'm dealing with. Uh, You're right, I don't. But I know who does. And on every page of scripture and in all of human history, the God who made heaven and earth and who knew you when you were in your mother's womb, and who understands every fiber of your being, he loves you, he loves you, he loves you. He is good, and he is a redeemer. He longs to take your stuff, your imprisonment, your burdens, your shame, your deception, and welcome you back to the family, and he will run to greet you. He will run to hug you and kiss you on the neck. I got five kids. Two of, my boy, two of my kids are boys. They're the two youngest. They're 6'1 and 6'3. So I'm not that tall. So when I hug my boys and kiss them on the neck, I have to get on my tippy toes or ask them to lean down so I can hug them and kiss them on the neck. And sometimes they don't want that kind of affection, but I don't care. I'm the dad. So the reality is, is that what I can imagine this dad running to get his son and he greets him and the son starts giving the story like, dad, okay, I'm not worthy to be your son. And dad just kind of quiets him up, hugs him, kisses him, has the servants running behind him. They basically put a robe on him. They put a chain on him and say, we're going to have a party. We're going to celebrate. And later on in the text, it says, my son who was dead is now alive. My son who was enslaved is now free. This last one, when you come back to the Father, there's celebration, not condemnation. Sons restored are a cause for celebration. Now, obviously, when I'm talking about sons, I mean sons and daughters. And obviously, I realize most of us haven't been trapped in a pig pen or we haven't been literally feeding pigs, but I just got to tell you this. We live in a world that's full of shame. And there can be a pig pen in your mind, whether you know it or not. There can be a pig pen in your heart. And I think the enemy of your soul feeds into lies and destructions about you. I just want you to hear that there's a moment where the prodigal came to himself. And if you're living under condemnation or shame, that's not from God. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I want you to hear this today. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you know him as Savior and Lord, and you're stuck in some form of pig pen, the Father is literally watching and waiting for that moment when you come to your senses and turn towards him. And if you do, he will run to you as you walk to him. Second thing I want to say to you is maybe you've never been in the family. Maybe you're not a follower of Jesus Christ. Maybe you've always wondered what this God, Jesus, Bible, and church stuff is. Why do they make us do all this stuff at Jess? I'm telling you, we don't make you do this because we're out to be bad to you. We do all this stuff because we love you. Your professors sweat and bleed over you because they care so deeply about you and your soul and your eternal destiny. And I want you to know this. If you don't know Jesus, if you're outside the family, the second, the moment, the instant, where you come to your senses and say, I want to be forgiven. I want to be free. And you take a step towards him. 
he will take a leap towards you and wrap his arms around you. The reality is this, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. But actually what happens is something very different. In Romans chapter 2, verse 4, it says, Do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? God has acted first. God gave us everything so that we could know him, and many of us have rejected him and ran away from home. He is waiting for you to come home. I want to just give you a couple more things. In Galatians chapter 4, there's an interesting passage that maybe you've never thought of with the prodigal son, but for me it just works. When the time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law. God wants to redeem or buy back those of us who are under the penalty of our behavior, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba or Daddy, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Let's do a little reverse. The youngest son got his 40%. He got his 40% because he couldn't wait for his pop to die, so he got it while his pop was still alive. He wasted his 40%. Well, I want to say this. This is our story. All of us are in the pig pen of life. The Bible said all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us have a mess of our own making or the making of others, and here we are. And what God has done is said, look, I give you my full inheritance. You can have 100% of my inheritance. All you need to do in the pig pen of your life is take one step towards me. And for some of you here today, you've never taken that one step towards God. And I want to tell you, he longs for you not to be a slave. He longs for you to be a son. And if you are here today and you've taken those steps, you say, look, I do know Jesus as my Savior, but man, I'm not walking like that. I got messed up, I got trapped, I made some bad decisions, bad relationships, whatever, and you're in a pig pen of your own making or the making of somebody else, I'm here to tell you this. You come to your senses and take one step towards him and he will run towards you. Anybody ever heard the story of Zacchaeus? I want to couple that story of Zacchaeus in a weird way. In Romans 14, 17, it says, The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Well, Zacchaeus demonstrates that. In Luke chapter 19, it says, Today salvation has come to this house. This man too, when Zacchaeus gets saved, is the son of Abraham. The son of man came to, came to seek and save the lost. You wonder why Jesus came to this planet? Jesus came to this planet to seek and to save the lost. And every single one of us in this room, you said it yourself to the person next to you, and they said it back to you. Every single one of us in this room need a savior. We're all messed up. A little, a middle, or a lot, we're all messed up. We all need a Savior, and Jesus came to seek and save the lost. One more passage, and we're done. Luke 19, 41. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, talking about Jesus, he wept over it. I want you to hear this. Every story Jesus tells has a purpose. God is good. He's a redeemer, and he's a healer. We're all in a mess of our own making, But the Father is literally waiting for the moment where we come to our senses and say yes to him. God is good. He's a redeemer and he's a healer. Would you close your eyes? While you close your eyes, just a couple more minutes and we're going to be done. I'm going to get you out of here. I might even get you out of here two minutes early. With your eyes closed. Nobody has to know. Not one person. Nobody has to know. I'm not going to make you even raise your hand. But I believe the God who knows everything, who made everyone, he knows you by name. Nobody else in your row, nobody in the seat next to you, right or left, has to know. But there's a lot of people in this room who are trapped in a pig pen of shame. I don't know how you got there. You might not even know how you got there. Maybe it was your actions or behavior. Maybe it was stuff done to you, but whatever. You're in a pig pen of shame. I'm telling you based on the authority of the word of God that if you are a slave to shame, if you are a prisoner of shame, that the God who loves you and made the whole planet and sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for your sins, he is saying to you right now, if you will come to your senses, if you will humble yourself and say yes to me and take a step towards me, I will run to you. So in the quiet of your own heart, 
if you know that you're trapped in shame and you've never said yes to Jesus, you feel like you are in a pig pen, that you are trapped. You're harboring unforgiveness and guilt and fear and anxiety. I want to speak life into you. Holy Spirit, would you please cause my brothers and sisters who feel trapped by shame to be willing to say yes to you? Would you cause my brothers and sisters who are burdened by the reality of the stuff of life to say, Lord Jesus, if you are who the scripture says you are, if you are who you say you are, would you come into my life? I yield and surrender control of my life to you. I ask you to make me brand new. Please, Holy Spirit, would you cleanse me of my sins? Would you make me brand new? Would you give me hope and a future? Eyes still closed. I want you to know that if you prayed that prayer and if you sincerely meant it, the scripture says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. And I want you to know that the Father in heaven has already run towards you and his arms are wrapped around you and there's people in this room today who long to pray for you, who long to walk with you, who long to hear your story and be able to celebrate. There will be no condemnation. There will be celebration. With your eyes still closed. Holy Spirit, for those in this room who say, look, you know, Dr. Jackson, Pastor John, I, I, like, I get this. I, I've been raised in church. I, I know this, but man, you have no idea. I made this decision and that happened and this stuff happened and man, I'm in a lot of stuff right now. There's gunk in my life. There's pig slop. Holy Spirit, would you take my brothers and sisters, would you take the men and women in this room who know you as Savior, but who just absolutely feel covered in filth? Sometimes stuff they did themselves, sometimes stuff that was done to them. And would you just take our lives, covered in filth though they are, and would you just wash us clean again? Renew our hope. Renew our spirits. For it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. God, you are good. You are a redeemer. And you are a healer. Lord, would you heal our brokenness? Would you heal our pain? And Holy Spirit, now, I declare and decree over this entire chapel audience that this would be the moment that we would mark, that literally, if need be, we'd write on account, this was the day where I said, I am not a slave. I'm a son or daughter of the Most High. And we walk in that identity and authority and clarity and we navigate the bumpy, crazy roller coaster of life in the power of your Holy Spirit. I declare and decree these things over my brothers and sisters gathered in this place and watching online for the glory and honor of the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.